one percent stock. Yeah, that's yeah. about the yeah. Yeah. gap yeah. between. It's really the doing like Actually, did anybody see the um, was it the Colbert Report thing, or maybe it was Daily Show, yeah, where they interviewed the Occupy people? Um, no, not that one. So funny. The guy's name was Ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> So oh wait, no, he's walking around on the street talking to people. Yeah, no, yeah, and then no, he um one. and he invites like two of their like leaders in yeah. and he like offers them like caviar and champagne. Yeah. <laughs> it's in a tent. It's in a tent. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so anyway, so today actually Nikki would like to um, talk about the evolution of Egyptian journalism and like just to make it <laughs> Sorry. Would you like to turn on um, the system here? So, uh, he is. Should just be. Um, so I might want to hit the lights. Okay. Hit it, Corsa. These are some examples of um, corruption of the press. So in 1990, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, uh, Saudi media held the story for three days and didn't report about it at all until the government had formulated a response for them. It's a pretty big event to just leave out of the news. And then in 1982, uh, the Syrian massacre. The anti-government protests were put down with really, really terrible violence, and it ended up that the Syrian government destroyed entire sections of the city that you can see here. It's pretty large destruction, and they said there was a minimum of 10,000 people dead, and some estimate 40,000, because they can't accurately know how many people actually died, because there was so much destruction, and the slaughter was never reported in that close society and reporter, reporters nearby were waiting to hear about it and they heard only rumors for the next few days and there were absolutely no pictures released. So even though there were people who said that they were privately owned media and that they were supposed to be the people who weren't controlled by the government, they still were run, run by the pro-regime businessmen who had their own agenda and weren't really concerned with accurately reporting. So there was a beginning of a change. Uh, until about 2005, there was nothing comparable to truly independent media, like what we think of what we have here, I guess, uncorrupted by bias and propaganda, etc. And um, reporters couldn't write stories that were very opposed to the Mubarak regime, or else they would be detained, and I'll talk about that more later. And this is when the emergence of digital reporting came, and this is basically blogging and like citizens going out and filming things on their own and making changes this way so people could get more accurate information. Um, Al Jazeera began in 1996 and it was a big news channel. And it began as a voice for change and began a shift of online journalism, but during the Arab Spring, it lost a lot of its credibility and began to show a lot of heavy bias to what 
towards the Muslim Brotherhood, which um, they talked about how Egypt declared the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization, so Al Jazeera had lost its good standing in Egypt. And it was also accused of propaganda for Qatar, and Qatar is where Al Jazeera was stationed. So, there are some big changes going on. Uh, the new freedom of the press, when, and I talk about that, I'm meaning like the new blogging that was going on and how new sources were getting information straight from the people who were in the protests. Uh, it wasn't necessarily inspiring new feelings, but it was letting people like release their long-seated anger about what was happening in their country. Um, they thought it was the most revealing and truthful depictions from activists who are posting this stuff online. Um, and the new technology that they're using, it appeals to ordinary people and empowers them more because they can take matters into their own hands, which inspired, or which was connected to how people wanted to have more freedom in their own country. And um, it also appealed to the younger generation because it was more online and almost a third of young Egyptian adults were unemployed and they saw a change, or they saw an outlet for their will for change in the country. It was also very easily accessible. More people saw that their own anger was mirrored in others and it incited more expression. So people were fighting for censorship these were, are fighting censorship, and these were the people who I was talking about before, how like when they opposed the regime, they were detained or otherwise. So in 2006, um, authorities declared the right to block, suspend, or shut down websites that were deemed a threat. And Egyptian law doesn't actually cover internet censorship, so there wasn't a lot of way, ways to regulate this. And um, a man named Kamal Reed, who is the director of Arabic Network for Human Rights Information, he said that most people weren't actually aware that this was happening, but um, it was the government was doing a lot of this. So this is a man named Kareem, and he he's in the middle here, and he was the first blogger arrested for protesting online, and. Um, to four years in prison, and he was, uh, his blog received global attention. And there's actually a website I found online that's called freecurrent.com. Is he still jailed? Uh, 2007. No, so, so. But he served his all four years, yes? Mm -hmm. just talking about with the internet shut down in January 2011. You can see it's getting pretty violent with the police. Um, in 2011, the internet shut down. So hours before one of the biggest protests that was organized online, it was organized via Facebook, and tens of thousands of people had said that they were going to attend. And um, it was starting in Cairo. So that's where the internet was originally shut down and then it spread throughout the country. Um, and then the government denied responsibility for shutting it down. And I have a bit of a video because I didn't, I sent it last night, but I know a lot of you may not have seen it. So.
question is just kind of some discussion about like how you think, I guess we can start with the first one, how do you think this new technology and media is influencing modern news sources? Just like all the new ways that people are getting information out to each other and how they were all gathering via Facebook. Anyone have any thoughts on that? I feel like there can't be that many people left who are actually watching the like the actual news on television. It's uh, controlled by the government. I feel like just pretty much everyone will go on social media. Right. <laughs> um, so do you think people rely too heavily on this? Because I was thinking about how in the video they said that they were still like trying to find ways to like find a place to rally together, but they didn't have a means of communicating anymore now that all of their like internet had been shut down and they couldn't communicate via text message. It was mostly just landline phones. And I was wondering if you think people like if something like that is so easily cut off, it might be I don't think they really have another option. By the state or bias, like Al Jazeera, then um, they're like contacting each other and like spreading news as like, like the best way they can, and unbiased and like as true mm -hmm. as they can. Professor, you'll be able to give a good idea of this. Did people in the area like even realize that shutting down the internet was a possibility? Like sitting here before it, that happened, I was like, wait, you can't shut down the internet. It's my thing. Like, did they, did they see that as happening, or did that just kind of boom? Well, you day? know, Nick. Uh, personally, I I did not imagine that that might happen in one day. So I couldn't imagine that the government has any kind of control to cut off the internet for for one reason or another. I mean just people protesting and you cut off the internet and then you isolate the whole community. I mean, that was something out of my imagination. Like, so yeah. Did they do just the major cities or did they successfully cut off like the internet and phone lines to the entire They made that across the country. Um, so right. like the most rural areas. Every every part of the country was isolated. So going along with that, like what was happening elsewhere in Egypt? Like I know Cairo was definitely the hot spot, but was, was everyone else real upset about this too, or what was going on? Oh yes, I would say that yeah, well, most people actually, we felt like, like imagine that you're going to have now police, you're going to have security, and the internet and the communication were cut off, and then you, you feel like, well, even for those who were not interested about the whole situation, they, they became very scared, and they felt like the government did something wrong here. And after that, so when, when the military inter intervened and the situation calmed down and then we got a new president elected, then we were thinking about the possibility for something like that to happen again. And so the government uh, gave assurances supported by, and even the military intervened to say um, such event cutting off the internet would never happen again under any circumstance. So, right, right. I definitely feel that um, like cutting off the internet kind of brought it to international attention. Oh, like yes. it wouldn't have gotten like, well, I mean, I'm sure that people would have realized it, but not to the extent that it um, right. like right. did. Like, for example, I probably personally would never have even like realized protests were going on in Egypt or like cared since I was what like in high school right. um, had that not happened because uh, I was taking Arabic classes at the time and like with people in Egypt that I was Skyping with and mm -hmm. classes were canceled for like an entire week when the internet was <laughs> shut down so um, yeah that's right. Definitely uh, very yes, it looks like that this strategy backfired against the government. So the government wanted to cut off the internet just to control the whole situation. But what happened is that the whole world, well, they started to say, hey, there's something wrong happening in Egypt now. <laughs> and, and, and so, yeah, that, that was something uh, incredible, even according to the global standards. I mean, now you have, I mean, well, in a very simple way, the banking sector. So the banks were connected completely with the internet. Mm -hmm. So when you cut off the internet, that means that the banks would not uh, wouldn't be able to 
open this case and work. Um, um, the flight schedules, uh, I mean the airport, the airport was closed. And so everything stopped. You couldn't imagine the situation when you take such an action. So this action was taken by the police, by the police institution. And because they were thinking from a very, very narrow-minded perspective, that they thought once they cut off the internet, they got to control everything. But what happened was the opposite. Um, so, question, question kind of more about how the internet there was set up. Um, was it all, was there, only, was there only just like one company that provides all communication right. services in Egypt? Is uh, that there are two major companies nowadays that they are uh, providing the service for the internet. But are they controlled by, are they a government, state corporation? Yes. Right, yeah. right. And so, yeah, and then the government gave the order, and, and then whether the chairman of the company agrees with this order or not, we don't care about his approval now, but there is something more important. It's a, a national security issue, and we have to, um, uh, I mean, we have to cut off the surface whether the company agrees or disagrees. See, in the United States, there are seven different servers that control the internet. Okay. So, massive servers somewhere, I don't know where they are, and none of them are controlled by the government, to my knowledge. <laughs> yes, they're all controlled by, like, I'm, like, I'm sure eight, one of them is eight, belongs to AT&T, one of them to Verizon. Right. Um, I'm no conspirator, but if the government wants to shut off the internet, it's going to shut off the internet. They can do that? Yeah, yeah they can do that. I'm sure. Um, but getting back to the question, maybe, I mean, definitely we rely too heavily on the internet because we don't even think about the fact that it has anything to do with our flights or with our banks, you know? You, you shut down the internet, you think, oh, man, I can't tweet now, you know, I can't send my precious little Snapchats now. But really, it's <laughs> everything we have is so interconnected with the I mean, internet, yeah. everything I do. Right. Right. Um, I don't know that there's really a different way for us to do it because we've had 13 years of getting more and more intertwined with the internet, but yeah, we definitely rely too heavily on it. At least we don't know how heavily we rely on it. But that also came in sort of bit the government in the end because if you shut up all these things, people like can't work, they can't go to the banks, they can't do anything. It almost leaves them with nothing else to do than to go protest, to go try to fix the situation. Or another interesting topic. I have another yep. question. Uh, yep. So they said they t shut off like text messages. So they cut landlines too and stop like phone calls and um, things like that. Well, they didn't. They didn't cut the lines. Well, they, they did something technologically just to cut the surface. But, it doesn't, uh -huh. the, but if they want, if they wanted to get the surface back again, they can make that easily. So they don't have to destroy or to make any damage for the infrastructure of the communication. Yeah. So let's take another question. So say that is there like a nine one one service in? Uh, yeah, yes, there is actually something which is called 140, so that is just in case if you need any help uh, regarding communication, so you, you couldn't even make a call with that. Um, Isn't that to the police though? Uh, you couldn't even, well the police withdrew from the situation, mm -hmm. so there is no police now. Uh, well, it wasn't here. Yeah. Where happens if you wanted to contact? Does 140 go to the police or does it go to someone else? Okay. Like in a normal situation? Where in a normal situation there is one central uh, number, uh, this is... Um, two, 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 oh, okay. right, uh, and then once you call that, you're going to have actually the police responding to any kind of problem you have, so that I'm talking about nowadays, mm -hmm. uh, like I still remember when I was in Egypt during the winter break, so there was something like, um, something like a clash happening between two groups, the first group supporting Muslim Brotherhood, the second one supporting the military, so they were actually sometimes, they were using, I heard, I heard, um, I heard the sounds of um, guns and uh, something like bombs, and, and so I called the number, and they said, "Yes, we got, we got that, and we will, we will be there. We will be in the situation within a few moments." Okay. So, and they arrived, yes, and we did that. We did every possible thing. To finish so it is possible. I was wondering, like, say someone had like a heart attack or something, you could contact like an emergency service oh, yes. and. Oh, yes. Do people trust the police again now? Uh, that's another interesting point, yes. That is, we can just make a session about that. Because now, okay, well, you, back again, three years ago, the military intervened in the situation to save the country. And so it was 
the military has a very respectable and prestigious image in the eyes of the people. Now, if you look at the people nowadays, you will see that the military is coming just to control and to control the country. And we don't want the military to be in Egypt, I mean, to control the political situation. We want them to get back to their camps, but not to interfere into politics. So their image is day after day going down. But I'm talking here from one perspective. Then you can find another perspective saying that the right choice for Egypt nowadays is to be controlled by the military. And this is why the commander of the military is going for presidential elections. And he has a popularity for that. And, and, and sometimes I think about, well, even, well, I heard just the other day some songs for him. So they were singing for him as well. So I was just thinking about, oh my goodness, now we are creating a modern dictator. It's the same scenario that happened 50 years ago during Nasser's time. So they were also singing for him during the Nasser's period. During Nasser's time, yeah. People were singing for him. People were just chanting slogans by our souls, we sacrifice you. Didn't you say a lot of them were forced to do that during? No, I don't think that. The, during Nasser's time, I meant. Yes, they were not even forced to do that. Um, there is something actually strange that pushes me to think about how people in, in, in my country think about this. I mean, uh, do they like to have a dictator? Or is this the right choice? Or. There is an argument that says also, this is very interesting to talk about also, the, 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 the culture of, of conspiracy. So they, sometimes they believe some argument, you will have like what happened in the revolution, in 2011 revolution, it was just a Western and American conspiracy, manipulated by the CIA just to create chaos in the Middle East. And so you can also find some other people claiming that, and they will have their reasons for saying this. Because CC was trained in America, do people think that he has like, connections uh, in America? And, and nowadays he changed his ideological background. Today, by the way, I was planning after the presentation to talk about ideological strategies just to, what it looks like, yeah, we will have enough time for that. Um, just, um, so yes, he changed his ideological background, CC, and nowadays he received, for example, after uh, the referendum for the Constitution, he received congratul congratulation message coming from the Russian president. But he hasn't received anything from the U.S. But he received a phone call from the Secretary of Defense to say that we would like to keep our strategic allies together and that would never be shaken. And, and so you, you can see that uh, the people today, uh, they see him like he is a symbol of pride. If you just follow the news, uh, just the other day, the Iranian president was talking about uh, the idea to have <coughs> the nuclear technology. Did you watch the interview between Farid Zakaria on CNN channel and the Iranian president? So the interviewer, Farid Zakaria, who is and a reporter and an anchor in CNN channel, he asked him a direct question. Why Iran, or when Iran will uh, neglect the idea of having nuclear technology? So the Iranian president said, we would never think about having this technology away from us because this is our national pride. And, and in the same way, so people see today, CC like, is a national pride for them. So he must be the president for the country. And this is why if you just ask me about who is the person you're gonna vote for, I, I would choose any person, but not a military person. I wouldn't choose a military person. Because I know at the end what will be the end. History. History repeats itself. Oh, oh yes, I mean, if you just put Egypt with India, put Egypt with South Korea, Remember the three countries, South Korea, India, and Egypt. Look today, the situation in South Korea. 
Look today to the situation in India and compare that with Egypt. During the 50s of the last century, the three countries, they started on equal footing. The three countries, actually, South, uh, as, uh, let me just also remember that the fourth country, Singapore. And so Singapore and South Korea, they came to Egypt to learn from Egyptians how to build new infrastructure. And look today at the situation. See how such countries, South Korea, India, Singapore, they made a huge progress, and Egypt is on the back line. There is something wrong happening. It's not coming from the people, it's coming from the government. In the so once you have military governments in this way, it doesn't work. Is there a third um, political party, like besides the military and besides the Muslim Brotherhood, that you think poses an actual like um, possibility of? Uh, well, you know, you know, Morgan, I, I would hope so. Let me just say that today, I mean, yeah, but yeah, but to be very pragmatic, the military is, 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 the, is the power that we have and the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, and believe it or not, nowadays, like today, for example, like the clash is happening. Tomorrow they're going to have another demonstration. The day after tomorrow. So they are very well organized. They have strong connections together. They have their own tactics. And I understand what they are doing nowadays. They are trying to extend the time for confrontation with the military, to enforce the military at the end, to find a compromising solution. Do you, it, there's really no other candidate. You have to choose between Muslim Brotherhood and the military. Which one do you think? Uh, there is a liberal candidate. I heard he's going to, uh, to run for the elections. So I, I will vote for him if he does that. Um, so I will I will make my vote for for him if he does. But I would I would I mean if I have only the military guy CC, then I would vote. You just I would. But did they they didn't set a date for the election yet, did they? Right. right. Well, uh, just yesterday that the interim president Adli Mansour that's his name. So he announced that we will have the presidential elections as soon as possible. And is he running? He's not running. No, he's not running. He's not running because he has a he's assigned in his position from the military because he was the president oh. of the Supreme Court. Okay, so he's controlling. So he will be back again to his judicial. Uh, That's one concept that I have, that I the one thing that I really thought was odd throughout following the Egyptian Revolution is that this Supreme Constitutional Court like, has carried over. From the past, mm -hmm. whatever constitution. Well, there is actually. I would have assumed they would have been, that would have been disbanded. But well, um, when Morsi came to power, they, um, well, they created a constitution, and it says in this constitution that once anything goes wrong, then the person who should actually uh, come to power is the president of the Supreme Constitutional. And so when the military intervened and they toppled and ousted President Morsi, so they brought actually the president of the court based off a constitutional activity in the constitution. But, did, the, the, um, didn't the, the, the before Morsi, before that constitution, wasn't the Supreme Constitutional Court still there like that? No. No. So after the year, after Mubarak was after overthrown, Mubarak, yes. the the previous, the prior constitutional court was abolished. Was abolished. Okay. Right. Why did I think that? So they created a new constitution after that. Right. Speaking of which, yeah. I haven't had much. I haven't heard much about the judicial branch, Egypt, the entire court system, or anything like that. It seems like the military is the law of the land. Right. That, that's another interesting part. We can also talk about that one day. Like the judiciary system, the judicial system in Egypt. Um, so we were talking about the military. Now, what what I believe that 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 was. That was actually one of the mistakes of Morsi. Like he also, some people claim that he came in clash with the ju judicial power. So he challenged the judiciary. And I just heard from William uh, another case to say like what happened between Abraham Lincoln and the judiciary uh, institution in the U.S. So um, Morsi did the same. Uh, so some people said what what he did. Some historians claim 
what he did was something wrong because it's very wrong to go in confrontation with the judiciary. Like you have a court says something, and you challenge the court to say, I will not actually listen to the uh, rulings coming from the judges this way. Rather than saying, we should follow the laws here. But some other historians actually claim that Morsi was trying to purify the judiciary from the corrupt elements inside the judiciary because most of them were very loyal to Mubarak's regime. But he couldn't do that. Yeah. How exactly are um, judges and you know people in the judiciary branch, branch elected their position, or how do they get it? Is it by appointment? That, that, well, that's another troubling point because. You can, like for example, I know a judge who, who expressed his opinion uh, for what happened in Egypt, like what happened in Egypt, he said that this is a military coup. So where he is now, he's in jail. And why he's in jail, if you just read the charge, he will say because he, he suppressed his political view and that is something wrong from and, but of course, this is fake. I mean, because well, you can feel once you have the military control of the country, then you couldn't talk it out. You feel like there is something wrong happening in the country because you couldn't define the certain borders of power: the judiciary power, the military power. Like now, the military has a power, so who's controlling this power? the question I'm trying to ask myself. If, if the commander of the army came to be the president, who can actually supervise this president? And it's why I like what you said before, Morgan, the checks and balances in the US. Because at the end, when you just gave him the absolute power, expecting the worst. Well, in the United States, the president is the commander of the, the, the army. The army. The military. military. Yeah. It's, it's not a people's well, it's, really. It's so, okay. okay. a title commander in chief. Um, this is kind of off topic, but I'm just thinking through this and putting a lot of dots together in my head. Okay. It seems like Egypt, and stop me if I'm hitting too close to home here, is characterized by very contradictive decision making. So, let's go back to. Muslim Brotherhood is elected to power, right. and then a year later they're like, "No, we don't want Muslim Brotherhood, right?" Or a year. Well, they didn't say that technically. Okay, but basically. But but they, well, what what happened is the people actually took out to the streets. Yeah, yeah. And yes. they protested. So the people elected Muslim Brotherhood, and then the people said, "We don't want Muslim." We don't want Muslim Brotherhood. So then the, the military protested the police, and then the people were upset when the police left. Uh, that's very true. And then the. Yes. People were happy when the military took over, and now the people are unhappy that the military is in charge. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, now I, make, I make that point, but <coughs> that's not totally fair because uh, America does that all the time, too. And that's kind of human nature. But it is interesting thinking through this. Right. Seeing right. it from in a, on the other side of the ocean, it's easier right. for me right. to see right. a contradiction right. than. Well, remember, Nick, what happened after the revolution? The military intervened. That the popularity for the military was very high because they did the right thing. They intervened to protect the country. They asked Mubarak to go out, and they told him, Enough is enough. This is the time now to go. So they responded to the demands of the people. So they were very happy. Now what happened is, they came to power, they controlled the country for one year, people started to feel upset about that. Like you said, you're gonna stay for a few weeks or a few months, but not to exceed a year. You look like you wanna be dictators and repeat the same dictatorship scenarios as we had before. And they started to protest against the military. Now the military felt that the people would go in confrontation with them. So they expedited the process to elect a president, and then Morsi came. And then after Morsi came to power, then we had another confrontation between him and the military. So the military intervened again to remove him. And the popularity of the military now, we have controversial arguments. You have the first camp saying the military did the right thing. 
the, the other camp actually settles, no, it's not the right thing, it's the worst thing we can imagine. And you can find that kind of polarization in the Egyptian society nowadays. I had just a friend of mine who's an Egyptian living here in the US for 35 years. So I was talking about what happened in Egypt. And he said, the military should go to hell. So he was actually very strongly supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. Do you think it has to do with age? Like, do you think like the older age group in Egypt favors the military? That, that's, that's also something. Did I tell you when my dad actually was so upset uh, for the way that Mubarak was built, so he, he was he was like so emotional. He said, "I mean, he is a military commander participated in Yom Kippur War, and that's what we're going to talk about. Yom Kippur War. It's called Six of October War, the military clash that happened between Egypt and Israel. Uh, and so Mubarak was a commander of U.S. of the of Egypt's um, air forces at that time." And, and, and so he was considered like a hero because he made a fabulous job in this war. Um, and, and so I look back again to your question. I would say it is something not related to, to, to age. I, I wouldn't say that because uh, the friend that I'm talking about is 67 years old and he's supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. So uh, it's not about age. It, let me just put something here. Like I was talking with my dad yesterday by using the Skype program. So I was just joking with him and I said, okay, dad, listen, I'm gonna sing it one day for CC. And so we were laughing because this is something, my dad is a professor in Egypt and I am a professor here in the US. So based on our educational background for what's happening, it's a farce. <laughs> Let me just say that. Is that the right word to say here in the US? Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Right, so, right, I mean, this is something that I wouldn't imagine, like, people today are drumming and singing for, for a person, so, in, in, my, in my standards, it, it's something not acceptable, but in the standards of other people, they would say, no, he's the right person to come to this country. So, do you think it's like a lower class, like, less educated people, who are... Use the right word, probably it's related to the education. Uh, I would say, well, well. Uh, now I'm outside Egypt, so I can see the landscape from outside. If I compare what's happening in Egypt to what's happening in India, to what's happening in the U.S., look at the situation that happened between India and the U.S. And I'm sorry to tell you that, but this is something probably may be a little bit offending for you. But but I was just analyzing that with some other students. Have you heard for what happened for the Indian diplomat? That's the only thing I've heard of, actually. Uh, yeah, one one, one was uh, arrested. Yes. Yes, I didn't see too much about it. Okay. But I remember seeing uh, that. So an Indian diplomat, a female Indian diplomat, okay. came to JFK and... That's right. Uh, what is it called? Uh, T T S A. TSA. TSA, <laughs> right. Okay. So they started to... They have some skepticism about her. And they asked, they asked her... Well, they were making some like stretch searching and then... And then it, the, the, uh, uh, a female one asked her to take off her clothes, um, and, and she was a diplomat. And what happened is India actually was very furious for what happened. So look to the situation. A democratic country handled the situation because it's just coming from, it's elected from the people. Now what happened is John Kerry, you know John Kerry, yeah. so he decided to send a delegation from the Congress to uh, India just to find, to calm down the situation and then India refused to receive them at the airport. <laughs> and that's number one. And then after Search that, Indians decided to withdraw the police officers protecting the US Embassy in New Delhi. Mm -hmm. And so the situation is getting, so it looks like what I can just analyze is India yeah. is just standing up and challenging the superpower. The question is, where India gets its power? How could they stand up against the U.S. to make something like that? Simply a democratic government. And then the situation now is coming up. You should read about that on Google. Uh, 
we haven't talked about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you think you're going to offend us with, uh, with the TSA, but in reality, we all do. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, while well, coming actually uh, during the winter break, I t I, I, did I tell you what happened with me in Amsterdam? Okay, well, so I was just taking the flight from Cairo to Amsterdam, Holland, uh, and from, from Holland, from Netherlands to JFK. So in Amsterdam, um, while I was just preparing myself to take on the flight, so I was stopped by the TSA, and so I...